Hi everybody, I'm Stuart Russell from Ross Video and it's a pleasure to be with you here today for the next in our series of Future Tech presentations. Uh, for this session, I'm delighted to be joined by Mac McLaughlin, who is CEO of FX Design Group in Orlando in Florida. Uh, and the reason why we have Mac with us today on the virtual sofa is because we're going to be talking about a subject that is very close to Mac's heart, and that is studio set design. Mac, thanks for being with us today. Really appreciate your time. Um, perhaps you can start things off by giving our audience a bit of an overview of your company and what FX Design is all about. Hi, good morning or good afternoon to you over there. Um, FX Design Group has been around now, I don't know, a little north of, I think, 35 years. And um, we're primarily set design. We also do lighting design for studios, grid, rigging. Um, but set design is what we've been, been doing for the bulk of our time. Uh, most of our clients I know are studios, uh, news studios, local news. We also have done sports, entertainment, uh, universities, uh, uh, houses of worship. And uh, one of the big things now is a lot of corporations are getting into uh, building studios for training, for getting their messages out to their customers. Uh, and uh, we're seeing a, a, big, a big influx of, of those kinds of projects now. Yes, I guess given the pandemic, corporations have to find different ways of getting their getting their messages out there. So I can imagine that is a, a growth area for you. I'm I'm intrigued as to the process. Perhaps you can you can talk to me a little bit about uh, how you how you focus on on set design, the kind of process that you you go through with your customers. Right. Uh, uh, it, it, one of the first places we start, actually, um, amazingly enough, is with cameras. Uh, you know, how many cameras are they going to have in the studio? Are they going to be fixed cameras? Are they going to be fully robotic cameras? Are they going to be tracking cameras? Will they have a jib? Uh, so we start with that so we get an idea of how the set can work, because if it's a fixed camera package, then it becomes more about math. You know, if we put five cameras in and they can't move, then all the set shots have to work without the, the movement. So it becomes uh, a little bit about math. If they have robotic cameras and jibs, then we have an opportunity to open things up a little bit to give them more freedom in the design and it doesn't, it's not as locked in. So, so we prefer that when they have movement, but uh, it's, it's not always the case. So that's interesting. So what you're saying is that really ca cameras are the starting point for the process. That's really where it all begins. Yeah, it really is. Uh, you know, then we get into their, their aesthetics and things like that, but we have to know the math of the project first based on the studio size and the number of cameras and the types of cameras that they have before we can, Put pen to paper. And, and in terms of camera technology, I mean, you, you, you touched on the different kinds of cameras that are out there at the moment. I mean, how does, how do the technologies affect your design for, from a practical perspective? Uh, well, like I said, if they have all fixed PTZ cameras, then, then the shots, and, and they want it, obviously they want as many different shots, as much variety as they can in each, in each package. And so typically if they're fixed PTZ, there's anywhere from four to maybe seven cameras but again they're all locked down shots and so we only have the you know the 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 uh, pan um, pan ability to move around um, if they have fully robotic then the cameras you know can move around the studio get more shots so we're not locked into and usually takes less cameras typically when they're robotic there's maybe three plus a jib or a handheld um, and then if they're fixed on tracks, again, that gives us more mobility in the studio to, to get different shots from less cameras. And when you're when you're discussing design with with customers, do you do you always have a strong sense that they, they really know the kinds of shots that they're looking for or are they looking for for input from you on that? Uh, it it kind of depends on the, the type of customer. So like news, there's kind of the standards, you know, there's the two shot, the four shot, the single shots at the anchor desk. Uh, stand up areas now, you know, a big part of design is the big video walls and, and they want to be able to walk and talk in front of those. So they have kind of an idea of what they like. Um, and then it's up to us to say, OK, if you want those shots, then this is how many cameras you're going to need or the types of cameras you're going to need based on your space to get the shots you want. So it sounds like it's quite a collaborative process then where, where the customers, many customers, I'm sure, really are looking for, for input from you on the aesthetic and the look and feel. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
And in terms of different projects that you've worked on, can you perhaps talk about a project where uh, you feel that robotics played a, an important role? Um, yeah, one that comes to mind, and I, I got to refer to my notes on that, but uh, one that comes to mind, I think, was KBOA. And with that, we had tracking, uh, you know, tracking, uh, fixed tracking cameras, if you will, and um, with um, PTZ heads, but we were able to do it with fewer cameras because they could obviously roll around on the track to get the multiple shots that we wanted. Um, but we had to work with, now we had another layer because now we're working with somebody at Ross. Okay, what track do we get? What's the circumference? Those kinds of things. So it adds another layer uh, to get it exactly right, to get the shots they want. Because when we when we render, we you know we, we build a model in, in AutoCAD and then rendered in Max or Unreal, we are trying to get as accurate a shot as we can. So typically when we give them a shot book, it pretty much lines up with the shots they can actually get in the studio with the cameras that they've that they've chosen. And with that particular project, what was the what was the purpose? What what was the rationale of incorporating robotics into the into the set? Uh, I, I you know again that was it, it came from the station, and I think it was um, you know they were trying to you know limit the number of personnel needed to get all the shots that they wanted, and and you know that's what robotics affords the studio to be able to do. And in terms of in terms of different projects that you've worked on, what are the key challenges when it comes to, to, to cameras and to robotics? What are the challenges that you've encountered and how have you how have you overcome them? I think, you know, initially one of the, you know, one of the bigger ones was price. And, and now as, as price has continued to come down, that's made it more affordable. Uh, so I think that was initially one of our our um, hurdles that we had to get over was was that. Um, and another that it's, you know, the, the next thing is, are they going to have the staff at the station to be able to manage the system? Um, so that that that's usually the next step for them. And if they feel comfortable, they can, then then there's no reason for them not to go in that direction. Another question for you, just with regard to, to kind of studio setup. I mean, obviously, a lot of cameras out there now have have talent monitors attached or have prompting. Uh, I'm intrigued as to whether customers care so much about about the size of monitors and and, and the size of, of prompting screens. If that's a, a big consideration for your customers, it, it it's a it, it's probably the number one consideration. Um, and early on, and and I don't think it was an issue necessarily with Ross, but some of the PTZ cameras that were coming out, there was no way to affix a prompter to them, and so they were putting a monitor either below or above the camera, which then changes your your eye your eye line to the camera, which was very disconcerting to them. So prompters are probably the number one thing that goes along with the camera being able to uh, affix the the um, that to it. And then for talent, you know, we're typically in, you know, eight foot range distance from talent for prompter uh, reading. Um, so the prompter's got to be big enough to allow it to be in, in that range. If it's if it's if it's got to be closer than six, that's usually a little too tight. So that would be the, the issue there with prompters. But yeah, that's definitely an important consideration. And in terms of different different kinds of camera setups yeah, and, and robotic camera setups, I mean, you mentioned rail-based systems earlier on when you were talking. I, I'm interested to know perhaps a little bit more about how you've how you've worked with those systems and how you've incorporated rail-based systems into the into the design of the set. Uh, yeah, like I said, once we once they've determined that that's the way they want to go, then we you know we've discussed it with the Ross team. You know what's available to us, and then we discuss. Okay, these are the shots we want to get. This is the set that we're going to drop it into. How do we fit it into that to get them the most flexibility? Uh, you know, because it is still an expense. So we want to get them you know the most shots they can from that rail system. And in terms of um, the length of track that you use in terms of the the, the different um, different radii or radiuses that, that are available. Um, have you ever come up with any come up against any challenges there? Um, no, not really. I think it's just just it's just the math. at that point it's math. You know, here are the shots we want to get. This is where the camera needs to be. What track will get us to that location? Um, and then then after that it's pretty simple. Now obviously. If, Obviously, one of the considerations with regard to rail-based systems is is cabling. Um, I wonder how you've how you've dealt with the challenges of that of of cable management and making sure that that things are are, are tucked away and hidden from view. 
Um, it, it typically hasn't been a problem. We've we've dealt with cable since the beginning of time. You know, even when we were you know manned cameras, there was always cables on the floor. Now, hopefully, someday soon we'll all go to Bluetooth and we won't have that problem. But uh, uh, it's really it's really not a problem. Uh, it's it's part of you know when when we figure out the layout. Okay, the cable's going to go this direction. It's going to exit out the set here. Um, it's not really a much of a concern. And in terms of set design generally, could, could you perhaps talk a little bit about some of the, the trends that you've noticed emerging over the last few years? Uh, yeah, you know, a couple of big things, and, and we didn't really touch on it much here, but, you know, one is AR, VR, uh, which is, and I think there's kind of two camps right now. There's AR, VR, and, and AR, I think, is really driving that bus more than VR right now. It, here in the States, I think internationally, VR is much more... Um, prevalent and, and, and everybody understands it better. And the second is bigger and bigger video walls. Now with, with LED video panels coming down in price, we're doing larger and larger video walls. And I think, you know, and, and you see that it may be the, the combination of the video wall and AR graphics. So you can bring a story to life. It, it walks, you know, a talent walks out of the screen or the graphics come out of the screen. I think that that's gonna be the, the next wave is combining AR and, and big video. And then I think eventually, you know, and I'm, I think, you know, AR is kind of the Trojan horse to get the system, you know, get the rendering engines into the into the studios. And then they'll go, oh, well, we've got this box and it will do VR, too. And if we do VR, we get a big video wall with it in the design. We don't have to pay for it. Um, so I, I think it's going to be a combination of those things for a while because everybody's comfortable with video. They're still there's still a, a thing, especially here in the States, or just a, an uncomfortableness with with virtual uh, but they love AR graphics. I mean, you see those everywhere now. So I think I think over time, and it may be another five or ten years, that it will pretty much be big video, AR and VR will be the drivers of the design, and then and then that really uh, unleashes the designers to be even more creative. Now you're not confined to things you can actually build and and uh, put in a truck and get somewhere. So so I think that is the future, but it's it's still a few years away. It's an interesting point because I've seen obviously green screen studios. I've seen studios that have a mixture of a green screen area and and a physical set, so kind of hybrid setups. And uh, I know at Ross we've increasingly been talking about extended reality. Um, and I'm thinking of a, a a large project that we did in China with uh, CCTV, which is the the national broadcaster, where they had a they had a large LED wall and an LED floor. Uh, and that way they were able to do some some really creative uh, creative stuff there. But I, I worry, are, are trends like that, are they going to put you out of business? Well, they still need a designer. Uh, they might put the shop part out of business. I mean, you need to have things that hold up the monitors and, and, and hold up the green screens and stuff. But I, I think there will be less building and more, more design. So I think the designers, as I tell my designers now, it's like, you know, when, when we get to do a virtual project, hey, you know, it's it's wide open. Have fun with it. Um, you, there's no no real constraints other than a sense of reality, right? You don't want to go too crazy. And I think some of the early that's one of the things that scared people. The early VR sets, they were you know elevators and you know things swooping by and stuff. And I I, I think you you need to stay out of the uncanny valley, as they say, and and keep it real and and in a sense of scale that people understand. Otherwise, they get confused in the space. But other than that, it's like you can whatever material you want. You're not limited to a you know, and you can, and you, you know, you, you do it in one color and six months later, three months later, they say, you know, that color is kind of old. Let's change the color. And now the, the set is, is a new a new set just by changing the color. So um, I think it'll be good in that respect. Um, and uh, but I think fabrication will will probably change a little bit. It's an interesting point. And, and what I'm hearing is that, that creativity obviously is, is important and you have the ability to be more creative now, but, but it shouldn't be gimmicky. It should still right. uh, it should still have a, a sense think, of, you know, I think especially for news, if you're if you're doing sports entertainment, you can have have more fun with it. But if, it, if it's news, I mean, their number one thing and we actually did a study a few years ago and their, their number one thing is being believable and trusted by the audience. And if it gets too gimmicky, uh, they feel that they, they're going to lose their their trust. They're going to, you know, they, they don't want to be, uh, you know, for the show. They want to be for the news. And just before we bring things to a close, while, while I've got you, it would be remiss of me not to ask you, have you ever had a, a meeting with a customer where they've asked you for something in terms of set design or they've had an idea where you've just scratched your head and thought, 
I don't think I'm going to be able to deliver this. Um, I, you know, I don't think so. I think, you know, what the, typically the challenge is, you know, give us something we've never seen before. Um, so, so that's fun. But typically when we, when we go out there on that ledge with them, they, they kind of back off a little bit because nobody else has done it. It's really fun when you get a customer that, that really wants to go there and they want to break the, break the mold and do something different. That's, that's actually a lot of fun. Um, and, and is that because perhaps your customers and, and our customers as well, is that because they're under increasing pressure to, to be more creative, to look different, to really stand out from their competition? I mean, how many? I mean, I don't even know how many channels we have anymore, right? I mean, you know, we, we you know we've got Hulu and Netflix and and Sling and regular TV and you know all the OTT stuff. So yeah, you've got to stand out as they're scanning by. Something something has to grab their attention um, to to get them to lock on even for a few minutes. So uh, again, you don't want to be gimmicky, but you, you've got to be you know crisp, clean, contemporary. I think. Uh, are, are probably the big buzzwords we get, um, and and able you know for news especially you know the set the set has to help tell the story. It can't just be a static background that sits there and, and people talk in front of it anymore. It's, it's got to help tell the story, help move the story forward, uh, and and you get to see that when you're doing you know the big videos and and they're able to maybe move from one panel to the next and and the story continues that way. Um, but uh, you know that's what they're after now is is something that will catch somebody's attention long enough to, to stay there. And you talked right at the beginning there about growth areas for, for FX design. You mentioned corporates and you mentioned houses of worship. What, what do you think the next year, 18 months looks like for you? I mean, we're obviously slowly emerging from the, uh, the, the dark days of this pandemic. I wonder what the next year has in store for you. Uh, based on what we're working on now, it's, it's a strong mix of traditional you know, news projects, uh, several cor corporate projects in in the pipeline, uh, and actually university projects are, are kind of the the three things that we're working on the most right now. Uh, I think once sports gets back up and running, uh, that will come back around again. Um, and another one that maybe uh, esports we thought that was going to be big, and then when the pandemic stopped, they you know they stopped meeting in person because you can do your gaming online, you don't have to meet in person. But I think uh, once once they start. Uh, you know, having big, um, big events again that they will, they will start uh, doing more sets again. Fantastic, Mac. That's been really interesting. Really appreciate you taking the time out to talk to us today. Very much appreciate your thoughts, and uh, and it was great having the time with you. Uh, thank you very much to everybody today who's joined us to watch, and we will be back with you in the very near future with another Future Tech presentation. But for the moment, that's everything from Mac and from myself. Thank you very much for joining us, and we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.